Good afternoon. You may have seen a video from the Fully Charged Show channel about misinformation and electric vehicles and wanting to do something about it. Their video was titled, Who's Trying to Kill the Electric Car? And what can you do about it? So here we are today with my very own version. Who killed the electric car? A response to the Fully Charged Show's fact check pushback. So basically this was Robert Llewellyn, the founder of Fully Charged, Dan Caesar, the CEO, and Quentin Wilson, automotive journalist, chatting about misinformation in the media and talking about wanting to do something about it. I found the whole tone of the video to be a little bit off, um, but let's have a look at some of the stuff that they say in the video and see if I can offer my own. Um, I've called them undeniables, which need to be addressed before we start accusing each other of misinformation. So. The video kind of starts by saying that something has changed in the anti-EV narrative. They say that EV sales are up despite the cost of living being up and the cost of energy being up. Uh, the Chinese brands are growing and everything's going well for EVs. Uh, you've got Volkswagen flying out to Shanghai to see how they make their EVs and everything's great. But then the newspapers have started to realise that anti-EV stories get a lot of engagement and engagement creates clicks and clicks create revenue. And what do points mean? Prizes. So what they're saying is that the media is being very lazy with its research because they want to push out anti-EV content because the anti-EV content is popular. They then go on to ask, is there an organised anti-EV effort or is it just lazy journalism? And that is, that is a good question. Quentin Wilson then notes that the Mail carried five articles in one week that were all against EVs. He says he doesn't think it's a dark conspiracy, uh, but it's very well funded and he's never seen anything like it. So my thoughts on this is clickbait is as clickbait does. Uh, it sort of self-replicates by its very nature. Quentin Wilson then notes that the writer of the Jaguar I-Pace article, this is the chap that drove a Jaguar I-Pace, it ruined his Christmas, he had a horrendous experience with it and it was shared all over the place. Uh, he noted that that had 7,000 comments and said to Quinton Wilson, I'll have to do another one. So then he replaced his electric Jaguar with an electric BMW. So in some ways, that is clickbait doing what clickbait does. So is this on editors? Is it lazy editing? Is it lazy journalism? Or is it something more? Quinton Wilson says that the research element isn't there, and by that he means the researchers aren't asking the three people presenting the video. So I think these guys want to be the sort of gospel on the EV world. Then you've got an anecdote from Robert Llewellyn. Uh, he talks about a woman that thinks that EV buses are bursting into flames because the EV buses were taken off the road due to an unrelated fault elsewhere. And I've noted on that, you can't fix stupid. If people are just stupid, then that can't be helped. It can be assisted with better editing and, and being a better editor and choosing your content better and doing a little bit more research. But if people are stupid, then people are just stupid. Um, but I've also noted there, you can't fact check people's experiences. So yes, we've had a lot of articles written by people saying that electric cars don't work and that they aren't going back to an EV after having a nightmare experience with an EV. But then shouldn't we really be asking why we're having so many of those articles outside of the context of clickbait and lazy editors? Because if the cars were any good, then we wouldn't have those articles in the first place. So from there, Quinton Wilson starts talking about energy transition and he talks about companies who've invested in EV technology who are concerned that the bad media, the clickbait, will kill the market and lose the money. And then there's some more talk about the transition. And then there's a quote here. We're very fortunate on the Fully Charged channel. We have a very educated, progressive audience who get it. And the reality is when people do get an electric car, they swear off petrol and diesel cars. Well, do they? Uh, then they start talking about doing something collectively, like the three of them ganging up. And Quentin Wilson asks, where is it coming from? Why is it so wrong? And why aren't people checking facts? So my question is, 
What facts is Quentin Wilson actually concerned about? So, if those three are ganging up together to provide accurate, fair and independent information, I feel like we should lay out the ground rules, bearing in mind I'm sat here in front of uh, a couple of Morgans, Morgan being a British company that makes petrol-powered cars for whom a transition to EV would most likely be disastrous for them culturally and as a business. So I've called these, right, my ground rules, I've called them undeniables. So let's lay out the undeniables. You could call them undeniables or you could call them hurdles. So these are the hurdles that the EV argument must first jump over before we can have a debate. So here they are. Where do the materials for the batteries come from? Brackets, how are they mined? How much environmental harm is done by an EV before it drives away from the dealer lot? Brackets, in comparison with a petrol or diesel car. Where does the energy come from to top up the battery? Does the UK have the infrastructure to move everyone to an EV? Does the world have the materials to move everyone to an EV? If we do move everyone to an EV, what will be the environmental cost? Do insurers know how to deal with EVs in the event of an accident? Do the fire service know how to deal with EVs in the event of an accident? And you could put brackets on there saying, what is the financial cost burden going to be on other road users for that via things like insurance or indeed council tax for fire services if they're financed by council tax? Are EVs causing more damage to our roads due to their weight? Are car parks and bridges at risk if we all adopt EVs? Why is the depreciation on EVs so awful compared to petrol and diesel cars? What do we do about people who cannot have a charger installed at their house? For example, people renting, council tenants, terraced houses, etc. And finally, is this really genuinely about saving the planet? And if it is, can we have an honest conversation about the benefits of leasing an expensive EV and whether it's honestly better for the environment to have a new car delivered from overseas every three years? And can we actually go back to the ethos of make, do and mend instead of promoting saving the planet by buying more stuff? Let's talk about keeping your old car for longer. If it is indeed about protecting the environment and the planet, then let's talk about keeping your old car for longer. Let's have an actual factual debate about the merits of keeping your old car on the road and not buying a new one, especially every three years. And for my sort of, and finally, right, I've been watching Quentin Wilson in classic cars uh, since I was tiny. I've, I've met Quentin Wilson on a couple of occasions. I believe I've even got an autograph from him from the Motor Show from probably about 1994. So I'm dealing with this in an extremely respectful way because this is someone that, that I, I really do respect. Now, here's my quandary. Quentin Wilson's known for his work in classic cars and he owns a classic car and has a collection of classic cars. So let's talk about what the classic car market will do if the EV movement continues and is indeed successful, notwithstanding the 2030 ban and all that sort of stuff. The EV market, by its very nature, and to some degree new cars in their nature, due to the cost of entry, is becoming a rent-only market, where owning and cherishing a vehicle becomes a thing of the past. The classic car industry only exists because people love to buy back into the sentimental side of owning a classic car that they had in their youth. You buy the car that was on your poster when you were a kid. The classic car industry and the market for classic cars only works if people are happy to spend money on their past. If the youth of today aren't interested in or can't afford to own a car, where are the future entrants to the classic car market coming from? Where's the new buyers entering the classic car market to keep values where they are? And how can we avoid a total crash in the classic car market if classic car enthusiasts begin to become extinct? Let's look at an example. The Jaguar E-Type, which Quentin Wilson's got one. Sorry, Quentin. Uh, the E-Type actually has the exact same problem that electric cars currently have. 
I've said in a previous video that an oversupply of electric cars in the second hand market, which is caused by overzealous business incentives for fleet buyers, has led to more cars being available to buy at three years old than there are buyers in the market. There are more cars coming onto the market from X fleet than there are people like me who want to go to a dealer and buy a used electric car. More supply than demand. Now, the Jaguar E-Type is doing or is about to do the same thing. Classic car values ebb and flow because as we get older, we buy the pinup cars from our youth. Now, everyone who wants a Jaguar E-Type has pretty much already bought one. And all of these people are starting to get old. Now, my generation, we don't want Jaguar E-Types. We want 1980s and 90s Volvos and BMWs. So, as the Jaguar E-Type owners all start to go into nursing homes at the same time and all start to dump their car collections into classic car auctions at the same time, who's buying the Jaguar E-Types? So, that's kind of like what's happening with EVs. As I've said, more supply than demand. So, Quinton Wilson, the person who I've looked up to for more than 20 years to tell me about classic car values. What happens to classic car values if you three stooges from the Fully Charged show get what you want and help push the 2030 ban on petrol and diesel cars? I have now laid out the, the undeniables, my list there. You can see it in the, in the description. And I'd like the three gentlemen from Fully Charged to look at the impact on the classic car industry and on our hobby if they actually get what they want. Which leads me to believe that there might be some vested interests there. With I mean, obviously, they're called the Fully Charged Show. They make money from people buying EVs and watching their reviews and whatnot. But I found the whole thing a little bit odd because, as I've said, it's very difficult to fact check someone's actual experience. If you've owned an electric car and had a nightmare journey and hated the experience of owning electric cars, how can that be fact checked? That's your real life. Is that what we're doing now? We're going to start fact checking real life? Seems to be the way things are going, doesn't it? There's a Morgan. That's not electric and it never will be. And that's what we want. Proper cars. Thanks for watching that one. Whoa, that all got a bit serious, didn't it? Crikey. I'm gonna be on Quinton Wilson's hit list. And that's the last thing I want. <sighs> Seriously, I'm, I'm not interested in Jaguar E-types at all.